Well, good to be with you this week. Uh, we had a great discussion this past Sunday on um, giving, and that's what we've been talking about in the Red Letter Challenge. I loved um, the picture of um, the, Red sea, uh, the Dead Sea um, that is often used when it comes to giving. The Jordan River is teeming with life. Suddenly it ends in the Dead Sea. And because it's not flowing any longer, not giving to any other river, it becomes rancid and yucky and about the only thing you can do in the Dead Sea is float because there's no life in it. Giving is what gives life. And today uh, we're going to celebrate that. One of the things I'm going to talk to you about is um, money management or that type of giving in our life. There's all other kinds of things we can give, but I want to talk about money because Jesus talks about money. And the first thing that I want to kind of create a picture for is a bank. When you go to a bank, um, what do you expect of your banker? You take some money there, you put it on deposit, you probably expect a little interest, you certainly want him to keep it safe, and here's the key. When you are want it back, you expect the banker to give it back to you. It's not his money. It's yours. Well, today I want you to just imagine that you are God's banker. Sometimes we call it a steward. That God has entrusted his resources to you. He wants you to use them well, make some interest on it, but at the end of the day, to remember, it's not yours, it's his. Now, we get our hands on it, we think it is ours, but ultimately it's not. All the earth, all the earth is the Lord's, and everything that we have is a gift from him. That's an important part when we start talking about giving, to recognize it's not ours, it's his. And when we begin to understand that and fully comprehend that, then we start to say, Lord, what do you want us to do with it? And he wants us to bless others with it. Now that conversion, as Luther says, um, is a tough one to understand that the Lord is resource uh, is over as Lord even of our resources. Luther said there's got to be three conversions that happen in the life of a Christian. First of the heart, second of the mind, and the third one of the pocketbook or the purse. And so today we're talking about that conversion of the purse. I want to start out, I have four um, Bible passages that I want to share with you today. And the very first one starts in Luke chapter 16, um, verse 10 where Jesus says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've been, not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And you think about that. God is saying he has entrusted us. And he says, if you can be trusted with a little, he also can trust you with a lot. It's a, it's a beautiful picture of saying, God, our relationship with God's resources is a matter of faith. Us trusting him to take care of us and him entrusting us with his gifts. Well, I want to again go to another passage, Luke chapter 19. Um, it's one that's very familiar, and it talks about that conversion of the pocketbook. There was a man by the name of Zacchaeus. You know him as a wee little man. A wee little man was he. Um, but he climbed that sycamore tree to see Jesus. Now, this little man had a big reputation. He was the chief tax collector, not just a tax collector, but the chief tax collector um, in that area of Jericho. I'm sure the people didn't like him. 
He was um, part of the Roman um, occupation of Judea. And he wasn't just any tax collector. He was in charge of a whole bunch of them. My guess is um, he was pretty ruthless in what he did, but he was interested in Jesus. And so Jesus says, come down out of the sycamore fig tree, Zacchaeus. I'm going to stay at your house. A beautiful, a beautiful, beautiful um, statement of grace as Jesus comes to the sinner and says, I am going to stay with you. And it says Zacchaeus, maybe because he was just tired of his life, he gladly came down and welcomed Jesus. All the people saw this, it says in verse 7, and began to mutter about Jesus. He's gone to the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus threw a meal, a big meal. He invited his friends, probably friends who didn't go to church very often. And I just want you to imagine the discussion that Jesus must have had with Zacchaeus sitting next to him. He, I'm sure he showed him his sin, but he also so showed him a gracious God who loved him. And he called Zacchaeus to repentance. And listen to Zacchaeus' conversion where he says, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Amazing conversion that's there. Recognizing all this wealth that he had accumulated in not so good way wasn't ultimately his. And he starts to share it, to give it. Jesus is excited by this conversion. And in verse 9 it says, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And here is Zacchaeus as we talk about following Jesus, not just with his heart, not just with his mind, but also with his resources. Now I want to ask you this question. Do you think Jesus notices what we give. You know, it's said in the Bible there are 500 times that Jesus talks about faith and prayer, but over 2,000 times where he talks about money. Money is important in our lives. It pays our bills. Honestly, for a lot of people, it shows their worth. Um, husbands and wives tend to fight over it more than anywhere else, and children always seem to be asking for it. And there's always somebody who's looking to get your money. And so, with all that being said, I want to just ask, does Jesus notice how you spend your money? Does Jesus notice your giving? Well, that's where I would like for us to turn to Mark chapter 12. And in Mark chapter 12, you have this beautiful story about Jesus in verse 41, sitting opposite the place in the temple where the offerings were put and watching the crowd put their money into the temple treasury. It's interesting. I guess Jesus did care. He was looking at people as the offering was being collected. It says, many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents calling his disciples to him. Jesus says, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. Does Jesus notice? You better believe it. Do you think that woman um, in faith who gave what she had was provided for by the Lord, you better believe she was. And so Jesus notices our giving, how we use our resources. Well, that's a positive story. I want to tell you one that's not quite so positive, and that story is in Luke chapter 12. So we're back to Luke, Luke chapter 12. 
beginning at verse 13. Here you have somebody in the crowd that Jesus is teaching, and they do something that I'm sure you might have experienced in your own family, or at least you've seen it tear up other families, where somebody cries out, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. This is Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Jesus refuses to get involved in this family argument, saying, Man, who appointed me as a judge or an arbiter between you? But then in verse 15, he gets to the point. He says, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. That's a mouthful. Life is not consist in the abundance of your possessions. Life consists in how we use our possessions. You know, I think about if you get a beautiful bottle of wine or maybe a nice um, a, a bottle of liqueur or liquor um, that you are there and it's something very special. When you want to open it up and share uh, and taste it, you're going to enjoy it if that's what you like. Maybe it's Kool-Aid, whatever it is that you enjoy. But I can guarantee you if you share it with someone else, your enjoyment is going to be magnified. That's what Jesus is saying. It's not how much stuff we have that makes us happy. It's how we use the things that God has given to us with others that really makes um, us wealthy. And then he's told this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns, I'll build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This will be how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Think about that for a moment. Was Jesus upset because the man was being an entrepreneur? By no means. But if you notice that, there's a lot of I will rather than the Lord will. And he thought his possessions were his and not the Lord's. The Lord had a way of dealing with that. And all those possessions were not able to save him. Only the Lord can do that. I want to go to another passage. It's in Matthew. Matthew chapter 6. And this is one I've been thinking about really struggling with a little bit. I want you to just read Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 with me. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Basically, what Jesus is saying is anything we have here on earth is not going to last. You're not going to last. It's not going to last. But he says in verse 20, Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, treasures in heaven. What do you think Jesus is talking about? You know, it's not that we can pay our way into heaven. Jesus has already done that on the cross. Our giving can't pay our way into heaven. Our good works can't pay our way into heaven. Jesus has taken care of that all already. But what treasures in heaven I truly believe are is how we invest our time our talents, our treasures in other people so that they can be part of God's kingdom 
also. You know, the simple fact is you can't save yourself, but you can be part of God's plan for the salvation of others. He can use you in that way through your acts of love, through your giving. And so I want to go back to Luke chapter 16 one last time um, that's there in this story where Jesus is talking about the parable of the shrewd manager. Um, we already looked at verses 10 and 11. They conclude the story. But this is probably one of the most challenging parables in the Bible because it sure looks like Jesus is commending a guy who's really a rapscallion, a really a rascal. But what Jesus is not doing is commending his dishonesty. He's commending him for his long-term outlook, how he used the resources that he had today in order to make a difference for tomorrow. Let me share this verse. It's Luke chapter 16. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. And the manager said to himself, Well, what shall I do now? My master's taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do. When I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtor. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, the first said. And the manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it out for 450, a 50% 50 discount. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? Well, a thousand bushels of wheat, he asked. He told him, well, take your bill and make it for 800, a 20% discount. Now, here's the interesting thing. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. What Jesus is simply reminding us of is all of our possessions are here but for a short time. And ultimately, they're not ours. We have to give an account to the Lord for how we use them. But what we can use them for is an eternal perspective, investing them in the lives of others so that you will have that eternal home not only for yourself but for others. That's why I'm so excited about the mission here at Redeemer. We are here to partner with you to follow Jesus into your home, into your family, and into your communities, wherever your influence, wherever your love, wherever your giving can reach. And that's why we work together as we follow Jesus together. Let's pray. Lord, today, help us to realize, first of all, that everything we have and we are is a gift from you. And you want us to be good stewards, good managers of it. And Lord, as we do that, we look at the wealth that you've entrusted with us. We look at our years. Give us an eternal perspective, Lord. We know we won't keep it all here. But honestly, Lord, as we invest in others, as we invest in your church, Lives are changed, and it makes an eternal difference. Lord, help us to be good managers, good investors. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord's blessings.